May God bless the reading of his word. Well, good morning. It is a joy to be with you this morning and, uh, of course, bring greetings from the Brethren at Emmanuel Baptist Church. Uh, we do pray for you regularly, and uh, we thank the Lord for all that he is doing uh, in your lives and in the life of this church. I must congratulate you on uh, this uh, mega facility that you have acquired. This is the first time I've ever been to a church with a bowling alley and a trampoline park. My kids were jealous. I said, why don't we have one of those at our church? I said, well, you know, we're not as, uh, as wealthy as, uh, as the people at Logos. So, uh, but no, it is a joy to be here and uh, to be able to share the word of God with you. Uh, please keep your Bibles open to the book of Psalms, uh, but turn over with me to Psalm 73. Psalm 73 is going to be our text this morning. And we're going to read this psalm in its entirety and make our way through it this morning as we consider the message this morning that I've entitled, When Life Just Doesn't Add Up. When Life Just Doesn't Add Up. Psalm 73, verse 1, says, Truly God is good to Israel, to such as are pure in heart. But as for me, my feet had almost stumbled. My steps had nearly slipped, for I was envious of the boastful when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. For there are no pains in their death, but their strength is firm. They are not in trouble as other men, nor are they plagued like other men. Therefore, pride serves as their necklace. Violence covers them like a garment. Their eyes bulge with abundance, and they have more than heart could wish. They scoff and they speak wickedly concerning oppression. They speak loftily. They set their mouth against the heavens, and their tongue walks through the earth. Therefore, his people return here, and waters of a full cup are drained by them, and they say, How does God know? And is there knowledge in the Most High? Behold, these are the ungodly who are always at ease. They increase in riches, and surely I have cleansed my heart in vain and washed my hands in innocence, for all day long I have been plagued and chastened every morning." And if I had said, I will speak thus, behold, I would, be, I would have been untrue to the generation of your children. And when I thought to understand this, it was too painful for me. Until I went into the sanctuary of God. And then I understood their end. Surely you have set them in slippery places. You have cast them down to destruction. Oh, how they are brought to desolation. As a moment, they are utterly consumed with terrors. As a dream when one awakes, so, Lord, when you awake, you shall despise their image. Thus my heart was grieved and I was vexed in my mind. I was so foolish and ignorant. I was like a beast before you. Nevertheless, I am continually with you. You hold me by my right hand. You will guide me with your counsel and afterward receive me to glory. Whom have I in heaven but you? And there is none upon the earth that I desire besides you. My flesh and my heart fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. For indeed, those who are far from you shall perish. You have destroyed all those who desert you for harlotry, but it is good for me to draw near to God. I have put my trust in the Lord God that I may declare all your works. This is the word of God, and may he imprint these words on our hearts this morning. Why do the wicked seem to prosper? Why does it often seem like so many good things happen to bad people? I mean, if God is sovereign and God is holy and God is just, why does it seem like he doesn't punish the evildoer? I think this line of questioning and this conundrum often plagues our hearts. I know it does plague mine. And if not dealt with properly, can lead us down a path of great distress and even doubt in the goodness and in the righteousness of God. Why does the scoundrel get rich? Why does the cheater seem to make good grades and not get caught? Why does it always seem like the meanest kids in school are also the most popular? 
Why do corrupt politicians get elected to power and stay in power, seemingly go unpunished throughout their life, even though they enact laws and enforce laws that often promote evil instead of good? There are certain aspects of life that at first glance, they don't seem to add up, do they, to the God that we read of in Scripture, the God who hates evil and loves good, the God who is just and holy and righteous, who promises to punish the evildoer and bless those who walk in righteousness. Take the young couple, for example, who seek to honor God with their relationship and save themselves from marriage, only to find out after they're married that because of some physical ailment, they're not able to have children. At the same time, thousands and thousands and yet millions of babies across this earth are aborted, many simply because the people just decide they don't want them or it'd be inconvenient. A godly wife is abandoned by her husband. Sham trials allow evil people and serious criminals to walk. So-called religious charlatans complain that they don't have enough money to buy their private jets, and yet godly missionaries don't have enough to feed their families on the mission field. Sometimes life just doesn't make sense. It doesn't seem to add up. This is not just a common problem for us, but is a common problem throughout the pages of Scripture. I think of certain people like Job and Joseph, for example, who were the, the subject and the, uh, uh, the recipient of, of great harm and difficulty, not only uh, by the circumstances around them, but by ungodly people who put them in positions where they had to suffer for doing that which was good and right. And of course, if you don't read to the end of the story, it seems like God has abandoned them and that God isn't being true to his word and that God isn't being good to them in these circumstances. One of the things I love about the Psalms is that they, they in many ways, help us to express the thoughts that are often in our own hearts, sometimes when we don't know how to express them ourselves which is why in many cases it's a good thing to, to live in the Psalms and to pray the Psalms because they help us to express deep feelings and deep thoughts that maybe we're not able to articulate ourselves. Psalm 73 is one of these Psalms, which for me anyway, for the past couple of months, especially this past year, has been at the forefront of my heart and of my mind, and I've had to go back to many a times to renew my mind and to anchor my soul in a time period when, it, when I look out and I see so much injustice and inequality and, and sometimes outright discrimination against God's people. As we survey the landscape of our nation, we, we see more and more that the ungodly are rising to power and enacting laws and edicts and, and orders that are uh, harming and hurting the church of God while allowing evil to proliferate across this land. You may have heard that soon anyway, probably, right now in Victoria, there's a bill that is being tabled and discussed and will probably get passed the Change and Suppression Practices Prohibition Bill, which under the guise of equality and anti-discrimination basically would make any attempt to discuss matters of sexual identity or sexual practice or homosexual practice uh, with someone or even to read scripture or to pray with them, someone who's struggling with same-sex attraction, if they find that act offensive, that could lead to jail time up to 10 years in prison. And yet that type of thing is elevated and encouraged and God's plan for our lives is discouraged and could come under threat of punishment. And this is where Psalm 73, I think, has to be here for us. We've got to live in this psalm, in the world that we live in. Uh, Alexander McLaren says of this psalm, he says, we have in this psalm the record of the psalmist's struggle with the great standing difficulty of worldly prosperity on one hand and the wisdom and the providence of God on the other. 
This is the tension that Asaph, the psalm writer, is dealing with in this psalm. And he takes us through a journey that we ought to go down with him. Asaph is the writer of this psalm. We don't know a whole lot about him. Uh, the only really details we have about him is that he's mentioned as one of the leaders of, of tabernacle worship. David appointed him as one of the main leaders of tabernacle worship in 1 Chronicles chapter 6, verses 31 to 32. Uh, we therefore conclude that he was a, a Levite and, and obviously a priest because it's mentioned in that passage that he had services that he had to accomplish in his uh, duties there in First Chronicles chapter 6. He had access to the tabernacle. He was in charge of, of leading the people in worship. He wrote a total of 12 psalms in total, Psalm 50 and Psalm 73 through 83. And whenever you read his psalms, you find that just like David, they are incredibly passionate and raw. Whether he's describing the justice of God on sinners or whether he is expressing a difficulty in his own heart, what you find about Asaph is he's incredibly honest. He's not ashamed to go to God with a conundrum and say, God, I don't understand what is going on here. Because I know something about you, but when I look at the world around me, it just doesn't seem to add up. So let's go with Asaph on his journey through Psalm 73. You'll notice when he begins his psalm, he begins his psalm with a helpful declaration. There's a helpful declaration here. Verse 1 is where he begins this psalm. And he makes a, des a statement here. He says, truly, God is good. That's how he begins his psalm. Truly, assuredly, God is good. Uh, this is a, a wonderful reminder. And this is a good place for Asaph to start. And to be honest, this is a good place for us to start. Whether you're dealing with a, a difficult circumstance or a tr tricky doctrine that you're wrestling with, to begin your, your uh, journey with the declaration that I know God is good is a great place and a great anchor which should stabilize your soul when contemplating life's difficulties and apparent inconsistencies. When you read the news, you need to begin that with, you know what, I know God is good. This is a great truth to remind us of. What is the goodness of God? The goodness of God, I think, is a central tenet to our understanding of everything in the world. Theologians try to describe the goodness of God in this way, that, that God is the final standard of all that is good, and that he is worthy of our approval. We see the goodness of God right through all of biblical history, don't we? In the very beginning, when we see God creating everything, he said everything that he created was good. Why was it good? It was good because God created it. It came out of the very creative mind and heart of God, and anything that God does is good. The Psalms cry out constantly of the goodness of God. We read it earlier, oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Psalm 106.1 says, Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endures forever. Remember when Jesus was on the earth, and he's having a discussion with the, with the rich young ruler in Luke chapter 18? And he comes up to Jesus, and he calls him good master. Jesus questions him and says, Why do you call me good? For who is good? Only God is good. God is good. What do we mean that God is good? Well, he goes even further. He says, truly, I know that God is good, but he takes it even further. He says, God is, is good, but he's specifically good to who? To Israel, to his people. You see, there's a general goodness of God, but then there's a specific goodness of God that he demonstrates towards the objects of his love, his people. Even more specifically, those that are of a pure heart. We know that the nation of Israel was in covenant with God. They had a unique and special relationship with God that no other nation had. But we also know that within that nation, not all Israel was truly Israel. That there were those who were just Israelites by birth or by culture. But amongst that, there were those who were of a pure heart. Asaph, I think, is one of those. He's not just a cultural Israelite. 
He didn't just grow up in a Jewish family and was just doing this by, uh, by, uh, by force or by, uh, by uh, you know, uh, compelling uh, by his parents. Asaph, I think, genuinely loved God. He was one of those who sought to have a pure heart because he says, I have purified my, uh, my uh, cleansed my heart and I have washed my hands. I have sought to live a life of righteousness and holiness. In terms of this attributes of God's goodness, uh, if you read the theologians, they often use this uh, goodness of God as kind of an umbrella. And under that umbrella of this attribute of God's goodness, they place three other of his attributes, namely his mercy, his grace, and his patience. Those three qualities often come under the, the goodness of God, that umbrella. God is merciful, God is gracious, and God is patient. In our evening service in Emmanuel, I've been taking our church through the book of Exodus. And literally up to, uh, literally tonight, we're going to be looking at the passage when God, sorry, Moses asked God to show him his glory. And then in Exodus chapter 34, verses 6 to 7, when the Bible describes how the Lord passes by Moses, and of course he covers him in the cleft of the rock with his hand because he can't gaze upon the full good glory of God, what did God say to him? He said, I will allow my goodness to pass before you and I will declare the name of the Lord and then Exodus 34 when the Lord passed before him this is what God declared to him this was his goodness he says the Lord the Lord God merciful and gracious long-suffering there's his patience and abounding in goodness and truth keeping mercy for thousands forgiving iniquity and transgression of sins but by no means clearing the guilty visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation. This is how God describes his goodness. Mercy, gracious, long-suffering, suffering, and abounding in goodness. What, what is God's mercy? What is God's mercy? God's mercy is his goodness to those who are in distress. God is rich in mercy. You are in distress, and God is good to those who are in distress. What is his grace? Grace is God's goodness to those who deserve only punishment. So when it says God is gracious, he is good to those who only deserve punishment. What's his patience? It's God's goodness to those who are continuing in sin. Aren't you glad God is merciful, gracious, and patient? I am or else we would be in big trouble. Now I want you to think about this for a minute. Asaph is a Levite and a priest. Do we think that his knowledge uh, of this uh, event was there? Do we think that Asaph would have known that this is how God describes himself to Moses, how he revealed himself to Moses, that he is merciful and gracious and long-suffering, and he doesn't clear the guilty, but he visits the iniquity of the fathers to the third and fourth generation? Do we think that he knows this? Yes, I think we do. But Asaph begins this statement, this psalm with this declaration, he's got to anchor his soul in the reality that God is good. And we're going to find at the end of the psalm, he's going to come right back around to this theme of the goodness of God. But even though Asaph knows God, even though he knows about God, even though he sings about God, even though he leads others in worship towards God, just like us, he is not immune from the doubts and the apparent discrepancies between what he knows about the goodness of God and what he sees in the world around him. And this is where Asaph ends up going down a harmful descent. So he makes a helpful declaration, but then he begins down a harmful descent. And this is verses 2 to verse 16. We're not going to read this again, and we're not going to actually get through every single little verse and every single phrase that's in here. Time would not allow us to. But in verse 2, he says, even though I know God is good to those who are pure of heart, he says, but as for me, my feet had almost stumbled, and my steps had nearly slipped because I was envious of the boastful when I saw the prosperity of the wicked.
Asaph is not immune to doubt, to discouragement, and to frustration as he knows who God is, but he views the world around him. And he says, it was so bad that my feet had almost stumbled and my steps had nearly slipped. This question of if God is good, why is there so much evil in the world and why do the wicked prosper? We know that this is not a new one. Many atheists and agnostics will ask this question. I think it was Epicurus who basically phrased it this way, that if God is able to stop evil, but he doesn't, then he is unloving. If God is willing to stop evil, but he's unable to, then God is weak. That's how the atheists and the Epicureans and the, uh, these philosophers phrase this concept. But, but Asaph's not asking that question. He, he's not looking at this through the lens of an unbeliever. He's looking at it through the lens of a believer, someone who knows God, but is just struggling to make sense of the world around him. He's struggling to figure out why things are the way that they are. He's struggling, and this perspective leads him to a place of doubt, where he begins to doubt the very character of God and the very nature of God. And he identifies this problem. He says, my, my feet had almost stumbled and my, uh, uh, sorry, my, my feet had almost stumbled and my steps had nearly slipped. A- Asaph borrows the language of the Psalms, particularly Psalm 1, the very first Psalm in the, in the Hebrew Psalter, when it describes our, our life like walking down a path. And he says, while I'm walking down the path, this metaphor of walking down the path, my feet begin to slip and he begins to doubt the goodness of God. Why? Because what does he see? He looks at the wicked and he sees, first of all, their apparent prosperity. Verse 3, he says, I was envious of the boastful when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. Verse 7, he says, their eyes bulge with abundance and they have more than heart could wish. Verse 12, he says, behold, these are the ungodly who are always at ease and they increase in riches. They seem to have everything. He sees their apparent painless experiences. Verse 4, there's no pains in their death and their strength is firm. They are not in trouble like other men, neither are they plagued like other men. He sees their unchallenged pride. In verse 8, he says, They scoff and speak wickedly concerning oppression. They speak loftily. They set their mouth against the heavens, and their tongues walk through the earth. Therefore, the people return here, and the waters of a full cup are drained by them. And they say, How does God know? And is there knowledge in the Most High? Asaph sees their apparent prosperity, their apparent painless experience, and their unchallenged pride, and this troubles his soul, and it causes his heart to slip and stumble so much that he literally gets to a point in verse 13 where it's like he throws up his hands in the air, and if you could paraphrase it, it's basically, what's the point? Why would you bother following God? He says, surely I've cleansed my heart in vain. It's empty. And I've washed my hands in innocence for all day long. I have been plagued and chastened every morning. What's the point of following God when the wicked seem to prosper and the righteous seem to get persecuted? Why would we bother? What's the point of walking down the path of righteousness? Because Psalm 1 tells us that blessed are those who do not walk in the counsel of the ungodly or stand in the way of sinners, but they will be like a tree planted before the rivers of water, but the ungodly are not so, but they're supposed to be like the chaff that are blown away with the wind and, and gone. And Asaph's like, listen, I'm walking down the path of righteousness and I'm looking at the ungodly and they're not looking very chaffed. Maybe a little chafed, but not chaffed. This doesn't make sense. God told me that I was supposed to have a blessed life. They seem to have all the pleasures and prosperity and popularity all around them. And yet here we are, trying to walk in godliness and righteousness, and we're the ones being oppressed. What's the real problem, though, with Asaph? 
he actually identifies it in verse 3 for us. He says, for I was envious. I was envious of the boastful. I was covetous. I looked at what they had, and I wanted it. And I looked at what I had, and I didn't want it. It didn't make sense to Asaph. He identifies the problem was not necessarily the reality of what the wicked had, but his heart's attitude towards what they apparently had. You know what's interesting? When you actually take a step back from this psalm, and you actually really think about Asaph's assessment of the world around him, and his perception of the wicked, and you sit back and you think about it for a minute, you, go, you, you actually go, actually, you know what, Asaph? your assessment of the world around you is grossly exaggerated. And it's just not even right. Because we know that not every wicked person has no pains in their death. Not every wicked person has more than their heart could wish. That the wicked are not necessarily at ease all the time. There's the perception that they are, but that's not actually true. And you see, this is the danger of a covetous and an envious heart, is that it only sees what it wants to see. It has tunnel vision. If you're covetous towards ease or prosperity or money or, 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 or a, a life of, uh, of, uh, of pleasure, you will view the wicked as having all the things that you want and are covetous towards. You see, the heart that is filled with envy doubts the sovereignty and the goodness of God. Why don't I have that type of relationship? Why don't I have that type of prosperity? Why does it seem like all the, all, all the evil people get what I want? Have you been here? Maybe, maybe you are here. I've been here. We can even be envious of other Christians, envious of their relationship with God. You may not even be a Christian, but you may be here because you're genuinely seeking to understand the complexity of this question. Why is it that so many bad things happen in this world and it seems like God does nothing? Maybe you're a believer and you've just taken your eyes off the Lord and you begin to assess and you begin to judge God based upon what you see around you and what's happening. Asaph here is expressing in some ways a sense of hopelessness. As, as he gets to verse 15 and 16, he says, If I had said, I will speak thus, behold, I would have been untrue to the generation of your children. He says, when I thought to understand all of this, it was just too painful for me. When Asaph is sitting in his armchair at home, contemplating his life and the world around him, trying to make sense of it all, it's just too much. You get the sense that he's on the cusp of throwing in the towel. Throwing his hands up and say, I can't do this anymore. But then, this psalm literally in one verse, takes this dramatic turn. And you can see Asaph starting up here with the declaration of God's goodness, descending down this harmful descent down to the bottom of the barrel, and it seems to make this dramatic turn, and Asaph begins to come back up out of the valley. Verse 17, as we see a heavenly discovery. He says, until... I went into the sanctuary of God, and then I understood their end. Until I went into the sanctuary of God, and I understood, my perspective changed. My heart and my flesh began to be renewed. What's the sanctuary? In the Old Testament, sanctuary can refer to 
two main things. First of all, it can refer just to the, the tabernacle area. Of course, the temple eventually became the tabernacle, or sorry, the replacement for the tabernacle, but that wasn't built yet. I don't know if Asaph's life uh, went through into Solomon's era, but nevertheless, he was someone who spent a lot of time in the tabernacle. What was the tabernacle? It was the centerpiece of, of Jewish worship. It was the centerpiece of corporate worship in Israel where the people would gather together regularly and, and come under all of the blessings of gathering together as a congregation. As you would walk into the tabernacle area, it was, of course, a place that was fenced off from the rest of the world around it. So it was a place of, it was a sanctuary, it was a place to go to escape all that was going on around you. And as you would walk in, there in the courtyard, you would see the sacrifices being made by the priests. A constant reminder that there was a path to forgiveness. That there was something that was being done to take away and to atone for your sins. You would hear the reading of the law and the teaching of God's word. You would hear the corporate worship as people like Asaph and other worshipers would begin to sing and lift their voices in praise to God. The word sanctuary can also refer to the very first section of the tabernacle, that holy place that only the, the, uh, the priests could go into. Asaph being a Levite or a priest probably and did have access to this part of the tabernacle as he could go into that next place in fellowship with God where he would see the table of showbread, a sign of God's provision. He would see the lamp stand on his, on his other side where it was a, a picture of the light of the world, that God was the light of the world. He would see the altar of incense constantly burning before the veil, knowing that right across that veil is the very presence of God seeing the altar of incense burning, knowing that the people's prayers were constantly going up to God. And he says, when I walked into this place, my heart changed. You want to put this in contemporary language? Asaph went to church. He gathered with the people. He was there amongst the people. This is the participation of the gathering of, we have to understand that the participation of the gathering of God's people can never be underestimated. It can never be underestimated. The corporate worship and the physical gathering of God's people cannot be replaced. There is no amount of technology. There is no amount of, uh, of new things that can ever replace the physical gathering of God's people together. I said it in my church, and I'll say it here, and if you don't like it, well, I'm not coming back. But I believe that the word online church is an oxymoron. You can't do online church. You can watch a service online, but if you're not gathering with the people together, you're not churching because the idea of the church is it's an assembly of God's people. And if we can be together with God's people, we ought to do whatever we can to do so because this ought to be the place where if we come in like Asaph and we're in the first part of this psalm, that our hearts can be drawn back to the very presence and the glory of God and we can come out of this place in the second half of this psalm, understanding God and understanding the world around us with a recalibrated heart towards worship. This is the importance of the gathering of God's people. He says, I understand their end. I get it. And Asaph's heart is turned from idolizing the temporal pleasures of the wicked to understanding their eternal consequences of a life lived in rebellion towards God. Asaph begins to speak of the coming and certain judgments on the wicked. Verses 21 to 22, he says, Then my heart was grieved and I was vexed in my mind. He says, I was so foolish and ignorant. I was like a beast before you. I was like, I have you ever come to... Have you ever sat in a sermon or come to church? You're like, man, what was I thinking? What am I doing? That's the purpose of gathering. The importance of singing and worshiping and listening to the word of God. As it should turn our hearts. This is the whole purpose of every aspect of corporate worship. Every inch of our service should be a reprieve from the world and the respite for our souls. I think we've done such a great disservice in our culture, and this even is be before COVID or whatever, because we have so emphasized in our Western culture a personal relationship with God 
And yes, you can have a personal relationship with God. You can pray anytime you want. You can go to the word of God anytime you want. But in some ways, I think that we have done a bad job of emphasizing the corporate worship of God. That the fellowship of the saints and the corporate gathering is an important thing. Asaph's heart wasn't turned by sitting in his room by himself. But being with the people seeing what's going on around him, separated from the distractions of the world around him. And his heart is turned. And he concludes this psalm by getting back to where he began. But I think with a slightly different perspective. Verse 23, he says, Nevertheless, I am continually with you. You hold me by my right hand, You will guide me with your counsel. And afterward, you will receive me to glory. Whom have I in heaven but you? And there is none upon the earth that I desire besides you. My flesh and my heart fail. But God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Asaph is reminded of the goodness of God. Notice he says, you'll hold me by my right hand. Going back to that analogy at the beginning where he says, my feet had almost slipped. I'm almost slipped over. You've ever been walking with your little child and and they go to slip and you grab them by your right hand? You hold them up? You stop them from falling and failing? This is what God does for his people. He holds them by his right hand. And you may be holding on to him, but he's holding on to you much tighter than you can ever hold on to him. He's guiding you with his counsel. He's holding you. And he says, afterwards, he will receive you and I to glory. And Asaph basically says, who in the world do I have but thee? Asaph comes to see in verse 28, that the greatest good in all the earth is to draw near to God and to put your trust in the Lord God always. He is liberated from these endless pursuits that a covetous heart brings. His passion and his love for God is renewed and he finds satisfaction in God himself. He is liberated from all the trappings of pleasure and prosperity and popularity. And this in closeness to God invigorates and inspires a newfound worship and even a newfound evangelism. Because he says, I put my trust in the Lord God. Why? So that I may declare all your works. You see, eternal perspective matters. When you come continually to be reminded that the nearness of God is sufficient and the apparent success of the wicked is all but empty and vanity. What does it prosper a man if he gains the entire world, yet loses his own soul? This is what Asaph comes to be reminded. And so, brothers and sisters, may I encourage you this morning, don't despair. Don't despair. Look heaven world. This world is not our home. The wicked and the ungodly clamor and they hold on to this world. Don't you get that sense? Haven't you got that sense recently that they will do whatever they can to just hold on to life? But brothers and sisters, there is more to this life than what we see and perceive and hear on the news. Let us run over and over again to this psalm Let us be reminded to come to gather with God's people whenever and often we can so that we may have our hearts and our lives turned heavenward. And may we be able to say with Asaph that God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this time together. And I pray that your word would sink into our hearts and our lives. I thank you so much for this psalm. What a blessing it is for us. What a, 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 an amazing uh, psalm it is to express what is often on our hearts. 
And Lord, I'll be honest, when I look at the world and I see all that is going on, it is easy to be discouraged and to be doubtful and to wonder what in the world you are doing as we feel more and more like uh, there's an absence of, of reverence or respect for you. And yet, Lord, as we come to your word and as we gather with your people, we are reminded that there is an eternity, that you are above all the kingdoms of men and that your sovereign hand is at work, and that you can be our strength and our portion forever. Let us be satisfied in you and you alone. God, lift our eyes, lift our hearts. And if there's someone here this morning who is doubting your goodness or your sovereign work, 